Hello, I'm Dr. Bradley Alisan, and I'm presenting on behalf of the Orthogonal Research and Education Labs Topical Deep Dive and Synthesis Series. And this is going to be a set of talks on something called breaking constraints and imposing constraints. So in this set of talks, we're going to explore sort of the boundaries and frontiers of information theory, thermodynamics, and sensory motor cybernetics. As you can see from the two pictures on the title slide that, first of all, one of the things we're going to talk about is the interrelationship between information entropy, which was defined by Claude Shannon and others, and thermodynamic entropy, which was uh, derived by Boltzmann and others. And so there's an interrelationship here, which is very interesting. And there's been a lot of work done, but no real clarity as to what it actually means. So we're going to explore that aspect. The second part is the Maxwell's Demon Thought Experiment. This was developed by John Clerk Maxwell, who really kind of laid the foundations for thermodynamic entropy. And we'll talk about this thought experiment a little bit later in this series. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Maxwell's Demon. This is was developed by John Clerk Maxwell, who really laid the mathematical foundations of thermodynamics. And he asked the question, how do, we, how do we extract order out of a random process? So to do this, he developed this thought experiment called the Maxwell's Demon. And in short, you have two chambers that are next to one another, chamber A and chamber B. One maybe is filled with all blue balls, one is filled with all red balls. And there's a doorway between the two adjacent chambers. And the idea is if you open that door at random, you'll, you know, the blue balls and red balls are moving around by diffusion. And so you get some red balls go through, you get some blue balls go through. And over time, you end up with a mixture, actually. Uh, thermodynamic entropy and statistical mechanics suggest a randomized mixture of the two if you give it, give it enough time. And so Maxwell's demon asked the question, what happens if we had a little demon or a little agent that opened and closed the door at just the right time so that you could take, say, chamber A and chamber B, both being a good, well-mixed uh, variety of blue and red balls, and then open the door selectively so that only red balls went to the right, only blue balls went to the left. If we had the process like that, given enough time, we could get a sorting. We could restore the original state of all blue balls in A, all red balls in B. So it's basically a reversible process of something like diffusion. And so the question is, is if we could achieve this, is this really, does this really require an agent? Does it require a demon? Or is that demon just to stand in for something we don't understand? Or is it just purely a stochastic process, meaning there's no agency required? It just happens via stochastic processes. It's just chance. And so this is something we're going to explore a little bit in, in the next few slides. But before we get to that, we need to talk about the zeroth order of thermodynamics. So if you noticed in Maxwell's Demon, we're talking about ordering and how things move from one place to another. And so we can have a stochastic process, which basically, you know, just as something moves uh, according to maybe like Brownian motion, where it's just moving around uh, with a certain uh, amount of noise around a central tendency. And then that, that's how things happen. And there's, you know, it's pretty simple. But we actually have a little bit more sophistication in nature than that. Uh, so we start with the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So this is where we have systems of different temperatures are transitive, and they establish a one-dimensional scale for temperature and energy transfer from colder to hotter. So this is where we have three chambers, at A, B, and C. Chamber zero is at, or chamber A is at zero C, chamber B is at forty C, and chamber B is at eighty-five C. And so the idea would be that trans, you know, energy would transfer maybe from something like colder to hotter. So you'd have energy transfer from 0C to the 40C chamber, then from the 40C chamber to the 85C chamber, then from 0C to the 85C chamber. And so you'd have this transitivity. Uh, as temperature increases, there's a chance for, like, you know, more activity 
for, you know, there's a chance for energy transfer from one place to another. This is where we discretize these different chambers of temperature so we can see temperature transfer in action. So if you have a pot that you boil on the stove and then you let it sit on the stove without any more heat being applied, that heat will diffuse outward towards the environment, which is cooler than what's in the pot, which is interesting because if the environment's warmer than the pot, it doesn't transfer as, as easily. So you have this, you don't lose any heat from that original chamber. And so we can establish regime of energy transfer. So this will become important later in the thermodynamics uh, when we calculate thermodynamics a little bit more mathematically. But it's important also to remember from a cybernetics perspective that a switch is a, what we call a zeroth order cybernetic system. So this is an example of a switch. So we have a switch, if we're familiar with our terminology, we have a switch here on the left, we have a switch that can be turned off and on. And it's a simple action of just pushing a button and you have on, you have off. And you can see from the middle image, this translates to a heaviside step function, which we often use in computation, but it's also a very good model of the on off switch. You go from a, a ground state to a state of one, instantaneously and you know this is like the simplest type of transition we can think of so we're not quite talking about phase transitions we're just simply talking about a switch and we're thinking about this as a zeroth order cybernetic system in other words it needs no feedback it just needs an input and it gives you a straight output and so this is a you know this can produce a binary output in a neural network with the heaviside step function but in physical systems, it can also do some interesting things. So on the lower right-hand side of the screen, it, there's this first-order phase transition that occurs when you have you go from liquid to solid nitrogen. So in this case, we can actually model a phase transition with a switch. But you know this isn't really the, the sort of the complexity of the whole thing. There's a lot underlying this first-order phase transition, which we're not going to talk about. But just to get this in your mind as sort of what we're talking about. We can also talk about representations of temperature. And so this is where we get into mental representations and even cultural representations of temperature. So we talk about, you know, going from cold to hot as a transfer of energy, uh, but we also have these representations which are where people conceive of something as cold versus hot. And so we can go from cold to hot as a one-dimensional scale like we did in the first example, or we can have a more complex relationship. So we have cold, we have hot, and then we have some culturally specific label that is uh, sort of uh, anchored to these different definitions. So for example, something hot might be hot, but it might also have some property which then mediates how hot something is. So two things of equal physical hotness can be diff of different sort of categories on this one-dimensional uh, space if it has an, an, an appropriate anchor. So, you know, if something is like a, it's a stone and it's hot or it's cold, it might, or you're touching something that's hot or cold, it might be different than if you see a color pulsate from what maybe is considered to be cold to what is considered to be hot. And this is, of course, the problem with mapping physics to information is that you have information that can be, you know, different streams of information that can come together and influence these kind of judgments in an agent. Whereas in physics, it's not as, uh, you know, there, it, it isn't as complex in that sense. So this comes from some of the work we've done on contextual geometric structures. This is where we have a general cultural model of temperature so we have our hot and our cold, which is this one-dimensional scale. And then we have these other anchors that can mediate that scale based on what the anchor is. And we can put that into a geometry so that we can sort of represent the position of that in a space. So we can look at some of the uh, representative things. In the first example, we had an example of transitivity. You know, we had a transitivity example where cold always went to hot. In this case, cold doesn't necessarily transfer to hot or hot doesn't necessarily transfer to cold. We can have multiple sets of relationships. 
it may not also may not be symmetrical. So depending on what context we find something hot or cold, it may have a different sort of scale. And then of course things can be distributed so we can apply all these mathematical rules to this sort of representation of hot and cold. And it can give us some uh, interesting answers in terms of modeling cognition and modeling some of the information be behind thermodynamics. So returning back to the first law of thermodynamics states there's a conservation of energy. So this is where the total energy of an isolated system is constant. So if we have an isolated system, a closed system, total energy is constant. We don't have any input coming in. We have a certain amount of free energy. And then that free energy is used up and becomes bond energy. And then it's maybe dissipated as heat. But the important point here is that if you have a closed system, you have no input. Once you use up the free energy, you end up with bond energy and that's it. And your system basically uh, asymptotes to death. And so the heat can, you know, it can be dissipated in the form of heat or whatever, and that's all you have. So the total energy of an isolated system is constant. Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but it can be neither created nor destroyed. No free lunch within our supply of free energy. We have a certain amount of free energy, it runs down, and that's it. Now we can First law of thermodynamics assumes a closed system. We have an open system, however, where we have an input of energy. Then we have our free energy, and we you know, use up our free energy, and it becomes bond energy, and it can be dissipated as heat. But we can continue to have free energy, and really the only limiting factor on our system, or the two limiting factors, is the rate of input of energy and the efficiency of the closed system, or what would be now the open system. So if your system has some efficiency, then it can last longer, it can do more things. If the input is greater, it can do more things. And so, but this is sort of the way we think about thermodynamics is this sort of, it, it requires conservation, it requires efficiency, it requires, you know, a certain sort of amount of work to be done and you can't just keep doing work without a supply of energy. So the second law of thermodynamics states that there's an irreversibility of natural processes and this is what's referred to as entropy. In the Maxwell's demon example we saw that the thought experiment really relied upon this reversibility that you could go from say like a chamber of blue balls and a chamber of red balls with a door between them and then you could you know, allow that door to be opened, allow the particles to diffuse so that you get a good, nice mixture of red and blue balls in both chambers, and then apply some sort of uh, demon, which again, we talked about, which is not really a demon, it's just some process we don't understand, and we can restore the original state. So we can have reversibility. But the second law of thermodynamics is that in the absence of any of that, that everything tends towards entropy. And what that means is that you end up tending towards sort of an uh, the sort of the mean value or mean field representation. So you have your your balls sorted into the two chambers, you allow things to proceed, and you get entropy. Blue balls going into the red chamber, red balls going into the blue chamber, and over time, given enough time, you'll end up with uh, a well mixed average in both chambers. Also, the second law states that there's a tendency of the system towards spatial homogeneity of both matter and energy, or dispersal. So this means that you have this dispersal of things. You don't have things sorted into neat little piles. They get spread out. They get averaged out over space so that where you had spatial heterogeneity, now you have spatial homogeneity. And so this diagram shows that depending on the complexity of the system, we have sort of an informational correlate, the second law. So the second law informational correlate states, is information counter spatial homogeneity of matter and energy? So in other words, as I told you, you know, statistical mechanics predicts that things eventually become sort of the mean value over time, that spatial heterogeneity becomes spatial homogeneity. But if you have information in the mix, does that counter that in any meaningful way? 
So it doesn't need to be a demon in the Maxwell's demon sense, but it does need to be some sort of, you know, informational gain that can be made that can counter this tendency. And so again, we have this complexity where we can go from a very complex system to a very simple system, or from a simple system to a complex system, we can reverse this. And we can actually have reversibility given enough information. So we still haven't talked about information, but we're kind of working our way through the laws of thermodynamics. So this is where we have, from the ever good regulator theory, we have this relationship between two sets of controllers. And these controllers represent a number of states, a system that exists in two different physical entropic states, but then have an informational relationship between the two. So the idea here is that if you have a simple system with very few states, it's harder to control a system with a lot of states, simply because you can't map between the two systems. So like if I had a system with three states and another system with three states, that would be a perfect isomorphic mapping between the two. If I have a system like I have in the upper left-hand side of the screen, with A having three states, and B having, I think, about 20 states, B can control A because the 20 states can represent those three states. And in fact, it can do it very well because it can represent it in a number of ways. And the feedback that A is giving it can allow B to represent those three states in, in the 20 state ensemble that it has. So it can control A successfully. But it's actually, as I say here, it's poorly regulated. And the reason it's poorly regulated is because when you have too many states, those three states, you know, you can often have what we call aliasing, or, you know, you can have different types of representations for the three states, and it can become confusing for the system to regulate that. Um, and then at, on the lower left-hand side, we have this, we have sort of the, uh, an opposite situation where B has three states and A has 20 states. And in this case, B is trying to control A and A will provide feedback to B and so forth. So this is another closed loop feedback system where B has very few states, A has very a lot of states. And again, we have at the top, upper left-hand side of the screen, we have high pass aliasing. At the lower left-hand side of the screen, we have low pass aliasing. We have the same situation where a system of three states is trying to represent the action of 20 states, and it's nearly impossible for those three states to adequately represent all the things going on in the 20 state system. So to reiterate, we have a system of three states that has sort of gone through entropy to, to a 20 state system, and then we have one of the earlier sort of versions of that system trying to control a later system or a version of that system. And the three uh, state uh, system can't control the 20 state system and the 20 state system can't really control the three state system. So this is where we have this, this difference in mapping and it's, it's poorly regulated. So the, the ever good regulator theorem states that any good system is, is a good map of the system and that good regulation comes from having this sort of good map and good feel for the, the system it's trying to control. There's a lot of stuff in some of the original papers on the upward regulator theorem. I'm not going to go into those now, but one of the suggestions is that a system with a lot of states can maybe more easily control a system with very few states. And we've done some work showing that that's not always the case. But what we do find, though, is at on the lower right hand side, we find this uh, example of a system that actually indeed can control a system of fewer states. So this is a system of six states in B, trying to control a system of three states in A. And so we find that this is actually a well-regulated system. It's not as well-regulated as a three-state system trying to regulate a three-state system, but it actually does work well because you only have six states as opposed to three states. So those six states have the ability to sort of represent every all the diversity of a three-state system without creating a lot of com competing representations and things like that.
So this is considered to be an isomorphic mapping. And again, you know, the process of entropy hasn't moved very far, hasn't moved that system very far away from its original state, and so it can control. And so this is, you know, this is a set of very abstract uh, experiments, but this can be, this is useful, I think, potentially. We're looking at different systems that have, you know, maybe the same origin point that have gone through different levels of, you know, different degrees of entropy, that have gone through different degrees of uh, diversification and complexification, and now need to be in the same sort of uh, realm where they have to control each other's actions. And so this is kind of, uh, this is not something that we've published, but this is something I think that's a good uh, thought experiment in addition to the Maxwell's DNA. Let's focus more on this idea of isomorphism and high-pass aliasing. In this example where we have six states trying to control three states, an example I gave of well-regulated behavior. The six-state system could regulate the three-state system pretty adequately, but we consider it a near-isomorphism because it isn't a one-to-one uh, -one mapping. In the near-isomorphism, in this case, we have three active states which control six active states. So this is actually where we flip this around from the last example, and we're using the three-state system to control the six-state system. So we're going to lose some information here, but it's close enough so that we can capture a lot of that information. The point is here is that we want to calculate some sort of differential uh, information. So we're going to switch gears to information theory, and we're going to talk about the, the parameter Hmax which is the maximum number of information here. And the maximum amount of information is basically for every state we have an H max of 0 0.5. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. So we have in A, we have an H max of 1.5. And in B, we have an H max of 3. And so there's a differential between 1.5 and 3. And so that it, the information is higher in B than in A. But it's not insurmountable. We can overcome that differential in information. And in fact, you know, in a lot of configurations, the actual information is less than H max. So this is something that we think about when we think about sort of information entropy. So this is an example of high pass aliasing. Now, in high pass aliasing, we have the example of a 20 active state system in A trying to control three active states in B. And as we mentioned, this is an example of poor control, so it's not very good control. And again, we said why is because all these different states can adequately represent three states, but it often gets confused and it has a lot of redundant information in it that doesn't allow for clear control to be made. And so we have this controlling of the three-state system. There's feedback from the three-state system. But you often get these competing representations that make it hard to figure out what the control strategy should be. And so we have this differential Hmax again of 15 Hmax for A and 1.5 Hmax for B. So you can see that there's a huge information differential. And there are a lot of configurations that A can take on that we don't know what that rep that how that's represented in B. And so I talk a little bit about this in the information as information aliasing in this paper, super performance, sampling, planning, and act logical information that's from studies in, co in computational intelligence. So we've kind of given a spoiler as to Shannon information and the parameter H. So this is Claude Shannon. And basically the idea behind Shannon information is that variety provides information. So as we saw in the Maxwell's Demon experiment, we go from homogeneity to heterogeneity or heterogeneity and homogeneity, and that's supposedly irreversible, but there's the shift from one type of configurational state to another. And so Shannon information kind of calculates this out without talking about the energetics of it, just simply observing the variety of states and coming up with a value for that ensemble that's probabilistic. So variety provides information, as you can see on the uh, right here, we have this picture of Claude Shannon that's transformed into these different colors uh, frames. So the, there's an information content of this ensemble on the right, uh, and we can calculate that out, and that gives us our information of that ensemble. 
and then information can change as the states change. So if we go back to our Maxwell's demon example, we have a bunch of balls, and as those balls start, you know, start to mix, we can calculate the information and see how much information is gained. In this case, as entropy, as physical entropy or thermodynamic entropy increases in the system. So as thermodynamic entropy increases, informational entropy increases, but there's no real relationship between the two mechanistically. It's just that it's a description of the two. And in, in this case, it happens to be similar. So, you know, this is something that, you know, we can describe this ensemble of states as a probability. And it gives us an idea of maybe like structure versus randomness. So we can apply Shannon information spatially. We can get information about spatial arrays. We can get information about certain types of information or certain, uh, certain ensembles at certain points in time and see how the amount of information is evolving in those systems. Now, Shannon information was originally applied to uh, telegraph lines and, you know, making those more efficient for sending messages. So it's been applied broadly since then to different types of systems. So, you know, a lot of times you'll go into the literature and you'll look at this and people have tried to adapt Shannon information to all these different contexts. And so it's very much, you know, sometimes it's decoupled from the mechanism. So sometimes, you know, it's hard to say what's causing the shift in information, whether we're merely observing some other process or whether there's some process behind shifting the information itself. So it's a very important thing to, to keep in mind in terms of Shannon information H versus thermodynamic information S. So this parameter H is information. It's the summary of information it can be calculated for any probability distribution. It's defined as event i occurring at probability p sub i. So it's this probability of an event. We calculate things on the ensemble, the probability. So basically it's bits per symbol, number of bits times per quantity. So we consider the breakdown of that ensemble to be bits. We have discrete in uh, discrete elements and then ensemble. And we calculate whether that discrete element has some event occurring or not. So if we're looking back at this example of Shannon information, we have the sepia pictures and we have the black and white pictures. We might ask the question, how many sepia pictures are in this ensemble? And that's two of the six pictures. So our information there would be 0 0.33 or H value would be 0 0.33, because it would be a probability of that ensemble, of that event in the ensemble. And so this is the way we can calculate information. Um, you know, you can use a summation to calculate this for a, a discrete system. You can also calculate information for continuous systems. And it's a little, the math is a little bit different, but the logic is basically the same. So uh, Edward James in 1957, wrote a paper on information theory and statistical mechanics. So Claude Shannon came up with information theory in the 1940s. And, you know, he kind of came up, he kind of fashioned the math after what Boltzmann was doing, which we'll see soon. Uh, Boltzmann, you know, basically used the same type of math. It's basically, you know, calculating the probability of things in an ensemble. And that, that that's a route to looking at thermodynamic entropy. Shannon used a very similar mathematical formulation to get to H. But immediately, since the math was very similar, people started to try to find commonalities between the two. Uh, Jaynes in 1957 worked, uh, tried to work on this interface of information theory and statistical mechanics. And he made the distinction that information theory is statistical inference, which allows you to make this maximum entropy estimate so you usually want to look around at the maximum amount of informational entropy, which is that H value, and you want to look at it with relationship to what your system, the state your system is currently in. So you're making a statistical inference about the total entropy of the system. Whereas statistical mechanics is a subjective inference. So it's subjective 
and that's decoupled from the laws of physics. So that's an interesting view of, of that relationship. Now, we haven't talked about S yet. Specifically, S is thermodynamic entropy, and we'll talk about that in, in, in later slides. Uh, this refers specifically to microstate probability P sub I. So this, again, is not information uh, P sub I, but this is microstate of a physical system P sub I. This provides an energetic profile for every state, but no ensemble. So when, when Jaynes talks about subjective inference, he's referring to this energetic profile, this energetic landscape, as opposed to a discrete ensemble. So the mathematics are very similar, but the sort of the underlying assumptions, the underlying sort of how you measure it is not. Typically with thermodynamic entropy, you have this energetic landscape. Particles maybe are at, in the peaks of this landscape, so they have a high energy, and then they go down and they evolve to a state where they average out to the bottom. So they move down the hill and they move down into a low energy state. And so this means that you have, uh, you know, less uh, heterogeneity. You know, you can start out with particles of different energies, but they all sort of evolve down to a low energy state. So this is, you know, we, we start off, we can either start off with a, in information with a discrete ensemble or in thermodynamic entropy with this landscape. But we do get these sort of convergent processes that are interesting to sort of understand in tandem. So thermodynamic entropy was uh, sort of developed before Shannon. It was developed in the 1880s. And afterwards, people thought about entropy uh, a lot. We'll talk about that a little bit later, too. Lewis from 1930 talked about the context of chemical entropy. And so in this work, he talked about how gains in entropy lead to a loss of information. So this is where he's looking specifically at chemical entropy and how you can gain entropy, gain physical entropy, and you can lead to, it can lead to a loss of information about that energetic profile. So again, we have structure. We start off with heterogeneity and the system evolves down to homogeneity. When it evolves down to homogeneity, we lose information because the information is no longer there. It's erased. And, you know, it's basically a process of homogenization, correct? You have all your particles. If your particles are different energies, there's an information there. If there's differences in energetic state, that's information. If there's no difference in energetic state, that information is erased. So this will become important later. But the point is, is that when Lewis talked about this, there was no concept of, uh, you know, we didn't really have a measure of uh, inter, uh, information, informational entropy. I kind of made a, a digression here from the laws of thermodynamics, but we do have to come back to the fourth law of thermodynamics. But we do have to talk about the fourth law. And the fourth law of thermodynamics states, where it rather describes the relation between thermodynamic flows in forces and non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So this is where we go from our closed systems to our open systems. Our open systems are much more dynamic and they have a lot of properties that don't represent that simple, you know, running down to uh, homogeneity. So this is the reason I bring up the fourth law is because these flows and forces may introduce things that allow for you to have non-equilibrium thermodynamics, have open systems, and don't have that clear move towards a loss of information. There's information coming into the system constantly with energy. There's and there are energetic structures that get built, and it's it's much more complex. So it isn't just that straight run down to oblivion. So we have thermodynamic variables that are defined in a condition of local equilibrium. So we have Places of local equilibrium, but not global equilibrium. Local equilibrium are reversible, non-equilibrium are irreversible. So we have both reversible and irreversible components. So an example of non-equilibrium thermodynamics includes tr turbulent fluids, 
coet flows, blast states, and lasers. So these are things that were developed in the 20th century. Uh, well, some of them were observed in the 19th century, but the mathematics were developed, and these represent non-equilibrium thermodynamics. These rely on both a past and a present local equilibrium, <clears throat> so they rely on time, the passage of time, and some of these uh, temporal uh, comparison of temporal states. And so this is important for something like uh, Maxwell's demon because Maxwell's demon is sort of a memoryless, or at least Maxwell's demon isn't memoryless, but the sort of the null hypothesis is memoryless. That if you didn't have a demon there to open that door, you would just simply have a system that ran straight to entropy, straight to sort of this well mixed state, and it's not something you could restore because. You everything is in equilibrium globally, and this in a non equilibrium thermodynamics context, you can have not only local and global states, but you can also have past and present states that uh, the system relies on. And so that then brings us to evolving dynamical systems where you have constitutive variables x1, x2, x3, these serve to fix an equilibrium state. You also have internal variables that serve as measures of non-equilibrium. And so this gets us into the work of Ilya Prigogine, where he talks about the systems of interacting chemical substances. And he also talks about dissipative structures, which are examples of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And we'll talk about those kind of systems, but suffice it to say this does fit into this idea of not just having a simple stochastic system. So in summary, for entropy, or at least for thermodynamic entropy, this is kind of a meme where you have one. First step is weight, and there's this well-formed meme, and then we wait long enough, and everything corrupts, and the meme becomes unintelligible. Or not totally unintelligible, but it breaks down in its configurational state. So basically, if you wait long enough, you can get this mixing, if we waited even longer, this image would be unintelligible in any way. It would just be a mixture of colors, and that would be it. But that's the summary of thermodynamic entropy. Now, the information is interesting here, because if we think about information purely as H, we can characterize each of these images. And so which image has a higher H value? Well, I guess it would be one, but it could be two. It depends on you know what we consider to be the ensemble and what we consider to be the different states and sort of the configurational diversity. So it may be that something that's undergone some entropy might have a higher informational entropy than something that uh, isn't, you know. But again, number one could have a higher informational entropy, depending on the way that we define that system. So we don't really have a good answer for this. Uh, what, what complicates things more is people talk about H as information content as well as entropy. And so, and I kind of made that slip up earlier, but uh, that's, it's not a slip up, it's just the way it's, the terminology works. And that's a problem because if we're going to map H to S, we have to really define it as entropy and maybe not information content. But in any case, I don't know what the clear answer is in terms of what the H value is for each of these. It really depends on how you define the system, how you define this, the ensemble, and then how you define the diversity of that ensemble. But just remember that the greater diversity, the more information entropy. And nominally, that uh, is the same as thermodynamic entropy, or it's at least consistent with it, but it's not always the case. So, also in summary, another thing we should bring to the idea party here, is this idea of Poincaré recurrence. So this is where we have, um, this is an old paper from 1986. This was James Crutchfield et al. This was uh, published in Scientific American, this image. And it basically is this idea of the Poincaré recurrence, meaning that if we wait long enough, so we have an image of zero, frame zero. And if we wait long enough, that image will be corrupted to be unintelligible by about frame seven and on through, you know, 
18 and 47. But then as we get to frame 48, we start to see images again. Things that are intelligible, as like, like Boltzmann, just kind of like shadows. And then it goes back to nonsense. And then when we get to iteration 239 to 241, we restore the image to some semblance of what we had in image zero. So what we're doing here is we're taking this image and we're warping it and we're transforming it in different ways. Uh, we're cutting it up and reconfiguring it. And then eventually what will happen is we'll restore or we'll come back to the original state. So this is a very interesting phenomenon known as Poincaré recurrence. And this was uh, observed by the mathematician Poincaré, where you have a system that starts at an initial condition, it kind of evolves away from that initial condition, but there are points in time where it comes back close to that original initial condition. So we can take this original image, chop it up, reconfigure it, keep reconfiguring it, and then at some point we come back to sort of almost like a facsimile of that original image. And so we have to keep, you know, it may take a while, but this system clearly didn't run down to entropy. It didn't just sort of always give us garbage after a certain point. We're kind of coming back to the original image. So we're restoring information. So this is a very important thing. You know, if this were a closed system, then it is a closed system in this case. We should expect that it would never return to normal. But because we have the way we have it configured, we have a closed system, but it's informational. We have this ensemble of bits, or we have this ensemble of pixels, and we're moving them around. We eventually can come back to our current states. And so this is something that is decoupled from, I guess, the traditional discussion of uh, H versus S. But I think it's something we're thinking now we're going to return to this idea of linking H and S. And this gets us to the work of Landauer, Ralph Landauer. And so 1961, again, after informational entropy has been defined, after thermodynamic entropy has been defined, you can now ask the following question. How much energy does it take to erase one bit of information at temperature T? So this is given an infinite input energy. We're just going to assume an infinite input energy. So the idea is we want to be able to take a bit of information, erase it, like we talked about. We're going to do this at a certain temperature because, as we said, things can be temperature dependent. If you have higher temperature, the rate of the, the probability of erasing one information group, one informational bit goes up because we can do more work at higher temperatures. And so, you know, we don't worry about the input energy. We just want to know how much energy does it take to erase one bit of information at temperature T. And we're going to assume that one bit of information has an energetic value, and we're going to define that in the equation. So we're going to work through this equation. We're going to see how it works. So this was originally published in 1961, the paper Irreversibility and Heat Generation and the computing process in the IBM Journal of Research and Development. And so here's our equation. The amount of energy has to be greater than or equal to k sub bt log 2. So we're going to do, you know, we're going to work with bits. We're going to work with energetic inputs. And I'll work through this equation in the following way. So ln2 represents one bit. This is Shannon information. Uh, this is our our bit and we're going to normalize everything by bits. T is our temperature, so our input temperature we have defined, or at least Landa or defined the energy required at room temperature to do work is 2.9 times 10 to the negative 21 joules. So this is a small amount of energy, but it's still erasing one bit of information at a certain temperature. So we have this normalized room temperature value and then we have Boltzmann's constant, which is the heat capacity. So this is a small value um, as well. But this is basically the mathematical framework. So this is sort of a qualitative view of all of this. So this is entropy S. This is our equation for us. This is defining our landscape and, you know, the progression of entropy. Uh, this is the slope of, uh, the slope here is the rate of information loss is related to the thermal environment. 
So our information is our information increases, our entropy also increases. And so this is the principle that we're working on. Uh, so T1, T2, and T3 are all sort of this information loss in a certain thermal environment. So as we lose information, our entropy goes up. These are just examples of that. T4 is here, again, following this, this set of trajectories going in this direction. And then the important thing to recognize here is that we can deviate from this trend of losing information and losing entropy in two ways. The first is through Landauer's principle, where we can erase bits and we can use information. We can also gain information as well, as in Landauer's principle. Or we can use Maxwell's demon so we can gain information. And actually, Maxwell's demon might go down even like this, where we might gain information by losing entropy. Maxwell's demon isn't the only game in town in terms of talking about how we can sort of get work for free. And so this is Leo Szilard and the Szilard engine. This is an engine that was developed uh, by, you know, it's basically a, a companion to Maxwell's demon. This is a thermodynamic system regulated with feedback, the applications of this something called the Einstein refrigerator. And so yes, you got that right, it's Albert Einstein. But it was also Leo Szilard, and they together developed this patent for what they called the Einstein refrigerator. This was filed in 1930. And so this is a meme of the Einstein refrigerator. It says Einstein is a refrigerator repairman. I got this, I made this with stable diffusion. And there's this article from the IEEE Spectrum talking about the Einstein Szilard refrigerator. Uh, and they kind of go over a little bit about this. So maybe a little surprising, but remember, a refrigerator is just dealing with thermodynamics. That's all it is. Um, and so this is something they patented in 1930. Uh, there are three working fluids in the design water, ammonia, and butane. Uh, this is and this is something that they, so it has no moving parts, operates at constant pressure, and requires only a heat source to operate. So you can operate this refrigerator, you can do work to create this thermal environment. This is an example of Maxwell's demon, but with only a single gas particle on a box. And what we're gonna do this in a different way than we did with Maxwell's demon in the chambers. We're going to do this with something that's going to be doing the work. And so we're pulling this weight up and down this pulley, and you know that's going to be the work it's going to do. So the demon can predict which half the particle it's in. So you know the demon can predict where a certain colored particle is in a in a box in half of the box. It has an information estimate, so the information content of its prediction is equal to one. It closes a shutter and extracts. And it gives us this uh, equation here, the number of joules of work it does. And this is Landauer's principle. The system is allowed to expand if the experiment is redone and the demon is accurate. Uh, in, interestingly, the global entropy of this scenario is not decreased, but information to free energy conversion, which is going from information to energetic work is possible. So we're going from H to J, we're not going from H to S anymore. We're going from information to joules. And this is something that, you know, it's another relationship that we have to consider. And so people have also explored the area between information and en energy. So, you know, there's this idea of having information and entropy, information and work, and then information plus energy. So there's this idea of intentional energy which is, you know, if, how much energy does it take to do intentional things? And that could be information based on information. It could just be on some sort of decision, which requires some information and so forth. Basically, how does this demon know where the ball is? We talked about that in the last slide, but also make a decision to open the door at a certain time. And so that requires some sort of intention. And so people have explored this in different ways. There's a term negentropy in the literature. Uh, there's anti-entropy. There's information. Basically, it's really kind of been a, a fertile playground for people over many years to come up with concepts. But no one's really come up with something that is really, really uh, 
seen as a smoking gun. It's just kind of like you know, ideas. Um, so basically, you know, we're we're our Maximus demon. Without the demon, we have a system that's Markovian. In other words, a system that operates without prior information versus a system that's ergodic, which is where you have global mean information. So, you know, we have like systems like this. We have a Markovian system where we don't really have any prior information. We just make a decision based on a current observation. We don't remember anything from the past. Versus ergodicity, which is where we have information about every single state in the system at one time. So we have a, a full account of the global mean information. So this is an interesting relationship between the two. And maybe I shouldn't have put verses in there. Maybe I should have just said something is Markovian. It could also be er er ergodic. But, you know, um, these are the kinds of different information regimes we're dealing with. But really, Maxwell's demon, if we return to this as a system where we have to make inputs and outputs, we have two different types of operations. So we have a write operation. And the write operation, in this case, and this brings us closer to computation because computations are based on writing and erasing. And this is also true of Landauer's theorem, but we're not going to get into that so much. Uh, the first one is a write operation, and that is opening the door for a ball of the correct color. So we need to write a decision to the system. We need to say, based on Boltzmann's S and Shannon's H, which, you know, when do we need to open the door? Do we see a red ball coming through? Is, you know, is this something that we want to sort into the right chamber, the left chamber? You know, we need to make all those decisions and then have a write operation that will allow us to do that at a certain point in time. Then we have erase operations. So erase operations close the door for balls of an incorrect color. So we can open the door for balls of a correct color. We can say, I want to write, say, the red ball into the right chamber or the blue ball into the left chamber. But I also want to erase certain states. So if a blue ball is coming towards the door and it's heading towards the thing that we defined as the red chamber or the right chamber, we want to close the door before it hits and goes through. So we want to not only be able to identify the things that we want to sort, but the things we don't want to sort. And that's important. And then that also maintains, so the write operation is based on Boltzmann's S and Shannon's H. The erase operation, however, is based on Shannon's H and Landauer's E, which is interesting because we didn't think about erasing until we talked about Landauer's principle. So our erase operation you know, how much does it take to erase a bit, the ball being a bit of information? You know, that that's something for future exploration. And so there have been some experiments that have come after Landauer proposed this principle. So people have worked on this quite a bit since then. Uh, this paper is from 2012. This is an experimental verification of Landauer's principle, linking information in thermodynamics. This was in Nature from 2012. This is where they actually are able to, uh, you know, work out a lot of this and how you might erase bits. The important point here is they're able to link information in thermodynamics using Landauer's principle. To finish up here, I have some more readings on some of these topics. I have this paper from Georgescu on 60 years of Landauer's principle. This is Nature Reviews Physics. Uh, Parando, Horowitz, and Sagawa on the thermodynamics of information, talking about the Seilard engine. This is from Nature Physics. There's Gould, Huber, Riera, Del Rio, and Skrzip uh, from 2016. The role of quantum information in thermodynamics, a topical review. So that's actually getting into quantum information, which I didn't want to get into because it's, it's probably complicated enough. Uh, but this has been transferred to the quantum realm. Barrett. Uh, Archelian, Petrosian, Siliberto, et al. Experimental verification of Landauer's principle, linking information in thermodynamics. That's in Nature. And that's a paper that we just saw. And then finally, Amadi et al. Irreversible work in Maxwell Demon in terms of quantum thermodynamic force. 
So this is talking about irreversibility and Maxwell's demon and, and sort of in the quantum realm. So there are a lot of other, so hopefully you learned something and have some food for thought. And we'll continue with part two in another video.